to the third session of today. It's one data pipeline to rule them all, as you're seeing on the screen. The speaker is Sam Kitajima Kimbrell. He's a software engineer with many opinions about distributed systems, data routing, and storage, currently leading Twilio's data platform team, building scalable and reusable data infrastructure to support a 400-person R&D organization and, obviously, its many users. Sam has a different hair color every month, definitely a different hair color every conference. And he lives in the San Francisco Bay Area with his husband, Cameron, and the dogs, Basil and Moki. Please give a hand to Sam. Kitaji McInbrell. All right, thank you. Can you hear me okay? Great. So yes, this is uh, one data pipeline to rule them all. Thank you for coming. Um, we're going to start with a show of hands. Please put your hand up if you have data. Great, for the video, that's basically the entire room. Please keep your hand up. If uh, you have your data, you know all the data sets you have, uh, how you access those data sets, how, you arrive, how those data sets arrive at the places that they're stored, and how you combine them to drive new data or analysis and so on. OK, a, a few hands. So some people have thought about this a little bit, but uh, definitely less than everybody who has data. So hi, I'm Sam. Uh, I have data too. I lead the data platform team at Twilio, where we build and maintain a unified system for storing, retrieving, and doing computation on all the data generated by all of Twilio's products. So I'm going to open this with a slightly abstracted, but hopefully familiar to some of you story. Um, this is a relational database. Uh, let's say it belongs to team A, and they set it up to store some data generated by their application. And it works really well. Until the end of the quarter comes, and the PM wants to run some queries to see how much their product's usage grew over the last quarter. Um, since this was built as an OLTP database for single row transaction processing with low latency, these giant queries that are summing up you know, millions and billions of rows are slow. And the PM says, hey, could we put this data somewhere that's going to make this analysis faster for me so I can actually get my reports done and maybe not knock over production, inf production infrastructure at the same time. So now we have a data warehouse and it's copying data out of the application database. It works pretty well, right? Um, we picked Redshift or uh, something similar. Uh, it's a column store. It's really good at running those giant rollups. And it's easy enough to copy the data in with a cron job and a Python uh, ETL, which is extract, transform, load, uh, the pattern for how you do this, uh, a script that somebody knocked out over an afternoon. So then team B comes along and says, oh, hey, you have a data warehouse. This looks really cool. Can we put some stuff in here? And so they, or you, uh, the newly appointed custodian of the data warehouse, welcome to your new job. Write another cron job to run a slightly different Python script, point at a different database, and copy their data in. OK, cool. So then somebody on your team uh, decides to change a piece of the schema because they need to support a new feature. But everybody forgets about the data warehouse until a week later when somebody on the accounting team, and by the way, when did you start using this, says, hey, why isn't the reporting warehouse updating? Well, crap. So somebody updates it, and life goes on. Then Team C comes along and says, hey, we've got this Cassandra cluster that we want to dump into the warehouse. Could you help us? And somebody else says, we want to do real-time spam detection on our data, but we want to run nightly training jobs for the model over all of history. Uh, can we have full text search? And so just like this, um, our data environment is not so simple anymore, right? We had this simple ETL flow that worked. Um, now we have a lot more pieces. Uh, we've got a bunch of cron jobs in our warehouse, something that somebody rigged up to do stream processing and we're running flat out just to keep up with schema evolutions and changes to the data model. And then finally, the accounting team comes back. And they say, why don't these two systems agree on how many API calls or page views or whatever it is that we sell anyway that we did last month? Because this is breaking our quarter close for the report. We can't state our earnings. Wow. <laughs> so yeah, we're the train. We've crashed out the side of the building. Um, we're not in a very good state. So this obviously is a very abstracted story, but um, pretty much all of these situations have happened over the last seven years at Twilio. And uh, they're probably familiar to a lot of other people, other companies as well. So what happened? What went wrong? We had everything working, but it cost us a lot in developer time and machine time. So at Twilio, uh, we took a look back at all of our legacy data infrastructure, and we found a couple of high-level problems with it. And so I'm going to go through those first. So first, we had architectural problems, including there are multiple sources of data and multiple destinations for it, right? 
um, there was some code reuse and each new type of system, but each new type of system required major work to add uh, and even new things from systems we knew about had to be hand configured. Um, this wasn't quite the worst case, right? There was some reuse, but uh, the growth trend is clear. If you have a graph with n nodes in it, the connections between them grows as n squared. This is compounded by the fact that there is no single source of truth for schemas. So changing data types or adding columns was risky and requires manual work to verify that things are working correctly. You got the photo? And uh, finally, there was no way to guarantee that all the data was correct in all the places it was supposed to appear, right? So network failures, host failures, even programming errors can manifest as data being wrong in one place or another. So if that's what was wrong with our train and why we crashed at the side of the station, um, what does our replacement architecture want to look like, right? Where do you want to get to? So we took a look at what the giants of the industry, so LinkedIn, Netflix, uh, what they were doing. We looked at our capabilities as a development team and as a company and uh, came up with some guidelines to optimize our data architecture for developer productivity, for scalability, and for correctness. So first, uh, we decided that there should be one and only one way to publish data into the new platform from applications. A lot of our early headaches were brought on by inconsistencies in how we move data between systems and having to duplicate effort across these uh, systems when making changes. So we wanted to get rid of that. We wanted to have a single system, a single pathway to be the canonical pipeline for records to fly, flow through regardless of how many places they had to get stored in the end. On the flip side, given that we need to put the same data in multiple storage systems to support all the ways we want to use it, uh, we can't dictate a single method of getting data into those systems from our pipeline, but we did feel it was important to provide common libraries and tooling to share as much of that logic as possible. And we wanted schemas. Um, I'm going to go into detail on this later, but for now, I'll just say that it's a lot easier to ensure that all of your systems work together nicely when there's one single authority on what constitutes a valid record for a given type of data. And finally, we wanted a way to make sure that every system that purported con to contain a given set of data had all the data, right? If a record is present and correct in one place, it should be the same everywhere else. And so since the title of the talk includes the words data pipeline, you might have guessed that we picked an event pipeline architecture. So from 1,000 meters up, it looks something like this. This is an, the classic event sourcing architecture. You model all your data as an ordered series of events in time. So for log structured data, things like web requests, ad clicks, and so on, uh, this is very natural. For data where records change over time, so configurations, um, anything that changes state, uh, you have to kind of think about it a little differently. You need to view your records as a sequence of deltas or changes to the data in order from which if you play them back into the same place, then reconstruct it, you can recon reconstruct the state of the record at any time. But they both are suited to this kind of architecture. Um, so we have some source of events, right? Let's call it a web server. Let's say we're handling requests and we generate a log event so that every time somebody views a page. That server emits a record onto a system, a data bus, a pipeline, uh, whatever you want to call this, that stores all of the events in the order they were received as a first in, first out queue. This is important here. And every system that's interested in that type of event subscribes to that stream, that single authoritative stream of data, and consumes the events in the same order they were produced. So important to note that these don't have to be the same type of data, or system, sorry. Um, this could be a relational database suited for transaction processing and on the top. We could have um, a column store for doing analytics on the bottom. We could have you know, some archival to S3 or something um, in the middle tier, right? Um, but they all consume the data the same way, even if they do different things at the end. And just, uh, just as similarly, we can have multiple systems at the front of the queue sending multiple distinct types of events on different topics or streams and set up each consuming system to only consume the event streams that they're interested in. So at Twilio, Apache Kafka is the backbone of this architecture. Um, Kafka is a horizontally scalable, fault tolerant, uh, very high throughput, and many other buzzwords as well, platform for streaming message delivery. Uh, if you're not familiar with it, it originated at LinkedIn, and LinkedIn publishes, published a blog post saying that they currently use Kafka to move over one trillion, with a T, events per day. And it's become wildly popular since it went open source. Um, it's very actively used, very actively developed and maintained. Um, and people ranging from Netflix, Goldman Sachs, and uh, since I'm up here talking about it, Twilio use it. 
So Kafka, uh, fundamentally, a Kafka deployment consists of a set of broker nodes. And brokers host topics, which are those streams of ordered events that I was talking about. They take writes the topics from producers and per persist as produced events to disk uh, to, and replicate amongst themselves to make it durable. On the other side, you have consumer processes that connect to the broker nodes. And the brokers deliver to each consumer to a topic uh, all of the events in the same order they are produced. And as they process events, uh, consumers send back acknowledgments of the latest event they received back to the broker so that if they restart or fail or get replaced, the consumer can start from the latest offset that it acknowledged. So in this way, Kafka guarantees that at least once delivery happens for each message that was sent to a topic to all consumers. Right? So anything that comes in the front is guaranteed to land uh, at least once on each individual consumer of the topic, assuming you write everything correctly. Kafka is fairly straightforward to operate. Um, make sure you read the manual. But if you're into managed services, uh, Heroku has a Kafka add-on you can add to your uh, deployments. And Amazon's Kinesis service exposes similar APIs and contracts to what Kafka does. Uh, so to recap what we've done so far, right? if we use Kafka as the core of this durable guaranteed delivery event bus, uh, we can treat every data set as a separate topic of events that are produced by the application systems that generate them. And then we can connect consumers as we need for each data storage system or processing application. So, so far, this is pretty standard stuff. Um, you can find a couple dozen blog posts on this from LinkedIn, Netflix, Confluent, and anybody else who uses Kafka. And from now on, I want to cover kind of the rest of the time we have um, things we learned and systems we built that are less obvious from the blog posts. So first up, um, schemas are important. This is a really strong opinion, so here goes. You should absolutely, by all means, definitely, without question, use a strongly typed serialization format with predefined schemas and validation libraries on both sides of your event bus. So there are a lot of systems out there, um, MongoDB to name one, uh, that just let you chuck arbitrary documents at them. Right? Um, here's a blob of JSON. Please store it, and then let me get it back some, at some time later. Uh, this is tempting. Uh, this slide is blank on purpose. I'm just going to talk for a while. Um, this is tempting. You can get started really quickly with things like Mongo or Elastic, but there's a cost to this. Your schemas and the enforcement of your schemas in those systems move from a single place, the database, to many scattered places in your app code. It opens the possibility that you're going to send or store data that you can't process later when you change your code, or in other systems that have to know about that thing. If there's a different implementation that shares a common schema, if that schema isn't defined anywhere except in the code, you can get out of sync. So if, to kind of have an example, right? if we have an application that's writing data somewhere, and a batch job written in a different language that picks it up and does something with it. Let's say it generates a report for the sales team. Um, if somebody on the team that generates the data drops a field from the data in the application without telling the batch job's maintainer, right, and the batch depends on that field, well, it explodes. Somebody has to go pick up the pieces, fix the code, and rerun the batch. And that's if you're lucky. If you're not lucky, uh, it explodes silently and just leaves you with incorrect, missing, stale, or corrupt data. And, um, like I said earlier, let's really hope that this data isn't what's driving your uh, financial reports. So yeah, please use schemas. There are a lot of open source libraries for schema validation and serialization. Avro, Protocol Buffers, Thrift, Message Pack, uh, and many others as well. Please pick one, and only one, and use it everywhere that you transmit data between systems. So at Twilio, we ended up choosing Avro um, for a number of reasons. It has official cross-platform support for Java and Python, plus community libraries for just about everything else. The Java library gives you both dynamic and static types, so you can either just get back a Java map or a co-generated um, POJO, which makes it nice for both whether you're going to deploy things that only deal with one type of data or make a nice dynamic system that can be reconfigured, and I'll get back to this later. And uh, additionally, when you deserialize things with Avro, um, as long as the versions of the same schema are compatible, so like you're adding a new field that has a default value or drop something that has a default value, Avro will automatically convert between versions, meaning that you can produce new versions of data into a system and only upgrade your consumer when you need to. And finally, it has this nice compact binary, binary serialization format that doesn't tag the schema onto every record, so you save some bytes. More on schemas. I'm still not done here. Um, enforce your schemas at produce time. So don't send anything onto your Kafka topics or into your event bus that is not valid, without exception. So if you do this, you get this really strong guarantee. Every record that comes down a topic is going to be valid for the consumers to deserialize. It keeps the onus of the data validation on producers, 
where it's easier to test and update because most data types are only going to be produced by one or a small number of code bases, but might ultimately be consumed by many more. Within a single topic, only make backwards compatible changes to the schema so you get that nice uh, transparent across grading. Uh, if you have to break compatibility, start a new topic on your bus and just migrate your consumers after they finish the old one off. So if you use these rules and follow them and you get this guarantee, then the worst that can happen when a change gets missed by a consuming application is a delay in availability, right? You can always go back and reprocess. So we're going to use schemas. Now we have to know about them, right? So we need to know what schema is in a given topic. So given the Kafka topic name, uh, we want to find out what schema applies to the records in it and what versions of that schema are available. And because distributed systems are hard, as Andrew Godwin's talk pointed out yesterday, if you were here for that, um, in the face of network partitions and host failures, we can't be guaranteed that we're going to produce or consume a record exactly once. And what's more, even putting them in order is tricky because clocks are hard. Kafka only knows about the order in which records arrive at the broker. So if you have multiple hosts producing to the same topic, you're going to have to sort the ordering out at consume time on the other side. So to do that, we need to know a couple things. We need to know which fields in the record constitute a primary or unique key. And we need to know what logic we want to use to choose a winner or merge conflicting versions, and probably how to order things too. Um, quick tip here on the side, um, wall clocks are not to be trusted across multiple hosts because clock drift happens. So don't just use the latest wall time wins. Um, there are things called vector clocks, which actually track the time across all the hosts that produce. Um, but you do have to have some source of serialization and locking to do concurrent operations on the same object. And finally, we might want, we might want to know uh, how to verify that data sets are complete and correct. So since we already said that in order to do deduplication and understand and correctly handle the data coming through, we need a unique key, we can reuse that, right? So a first pass at recon reconciliation between data different systems is just do a count distinct, right? Count all the unique keys we've seen. Um, if there are additional checks you want to perform, right, like, like summing up the amount of all your transactions or something, you, could, you want to know the aggregate operations to apply and which fields you're going to run them over. So, so far we've gone through uh, what we started off with at Twilio what we disliked about the original systems and what we wanted out of our new architecture, and then finally the core abstractions that are involved in this Kafka-based event pipeline. Uh, I want to tell you now about uh, the systems and libraries we built to augment our Kafka cluster and make it actually usable and um, useful to us to connect it to our data sources and sinks. So as I hinted at, uh, we have our metadata registry API. Storing the record schemas and all of the additional metadata about uniqueness, uh, ordering, and correctness in this registry Let's just access that information programmatically and use that from any system that's going to produce or consume records. It's important to note that this schema registry service doesn't actually handle any records itself. It just stores the schemas for the records and the extra metadata for topics, validates that new versions of schemas that you register are compatible with the previous ones because you want version compatibility, and then serves that metadata back out to any system that needs it. So obviously we use it in two places. Um, before you produce a record to a topic, you want to make sure that it's the correct schema for that topic, so you go look, up, look it up. Uh, Kafka comes with producer and consumer implementations for a whole bunch of languages, but like Kafka itself, it just knows about, those just know about byte streams, right? Kafka brokers don't view records in a topic as anything other than binary blobs, and this is part of why it's so fast. It's just shifting bytes around. So we built a wrapper around these libraries to handle the serialization and validation. So our producer library, when you go to send something, accepts an AVA record object, validates that it conforms to the known schema for the topic you want to send it to, and then serializes correctly and uh, adds an extra byte on the front to signal the, next version, the version of the schema that we're using here. On the far side, in the consumer, our wrapper does the opposite, right? It says, I'm consuming the widgets topic, goes, looks it up, finds the schema document uh, for that version on the serialized record that it just pulled off the topic, and then deserializes back to whatever the application code on that side wants to work with. So Twilio is a very polyglot development environment. We run a lot of Python, a lot of Java and Scala, some PHP, and there's even a little bit of Ruby, Node, and Go scattered around. Our pipeline libraries, the official libraries we support for people who want to do, produce directly to Kafka, support Python and Java, but we decided against porting it to those four more languages because it would have been a lot of effort for diminishing returns. So we also already have very well-defined and supported standards inside of Twilio for internal REST APIs with JSON serialization. So we designed a simple service, uh, and it does exactly what it looks like here. 
to produce to Kafka topics in response to HTTP requests, right? So you just put at this system with a JSON blob with your data and it validates, does the exact same work, right? It validates that this is the correct schema for this and then puts it on topic for you. And so if you're not in Java or in Python, um, you can just chuck rec records at this API over HTTP and not have to worry about talking to Kafka. Okay, so that covers it for producing records. Um, I'm gonna talk about what we do with them on the far side now. And this breaks down into roughly six types of systems. So first we can archive things to inexpensive and scalable cold storage. Um, we use this archive data to power three more use cases, right? So we can put it in data warehouses to do analysis on the structured subsets that we know about ahead of time. We can run batch processing jobs over arbitrary large amounts of data with uh, on-demand com compute capacity. And we can do ad hoc analysis of archive data without having to load it into a warehouse. And then we have stream processing. Since Kafka has high throughput and low latency, uh, you can connect streaming applications directly as Kafka consumers to process records very close to real time. And finally, uh, you can connect transaction databases like MySQL or Elasticsearch to provide access to small amounts of recent history with very low end-to-end -end latency from produce to query time. So we'll go through these in order. Um, we'll start with archival. So we call this Twilio FS, um, which is just a data lake, uh, which is a term that some data architects made up to describe what happens when you dump everything you collect into one place so you can extract chunks of it for further processing or analysis. And this looks like this. Uh, we use Amazon S3, and we have a system we call Copycat. Kafka, Kafka brokers, uh, most importantly, don't have infinite storage space because they use the local disk, and therefore they only retain a fixed amount of time for each topic before they just delete data to make room for new data. So Copycat has one job, to copy, byte for byte, entire Kafka topics into Amazon S3. Uh, it's a Kafka Connect application. Connect is a framework that's distributed with Kafka and it's designed for exactly this, of consuming from Kafka and writing it somewhere else or reading from a source system and producing it to Kafka. It has this framework, basically it just handles the operation of connecting to Kafka and consuming records and it just hands you records and you decide what you want to do with them. We use this for most of the sync systems that we write Kafka records to. Its output is organized by the topic and partition, then the date and the hour, and then the highest offset in the Kafka batch that was flushed into that, this, this output file. Before we've done anything else with this data, right, so Copycat has already given this really neat capability. Uh, the output is a perfect copy of the original Kafka topic in order, and so we can replay any subset of it back into Kafka, and it's like we've gone back in time. So it's really useful if you find three months down the line that you had a bug in your logic, and you want to go and reprocess those three months, right? You just go pick it back up out of S3 and replay it into Kafka. But it's just the first step in our data archive. Because Copycat's output is just the Kafka topic, it's not guaranteed to be unique or in order because distributed systems. And so we run a system called Copy Dog. Um, I don't really know why we named it this. I think it's just that the dog chases the cat um, and cleans it up. So Copy Dog is a Spark job, and what it does is it takes the raw topic data that we get from Copycat in S3 and it organizes it for us. And this is the first place that that topic metadata I was talking about comes into play. That deduplication and ordering configuration is configuration that drives CopyDog. So it uses its knowledge of how to sort and merge records to give us a verified, sorted, and deduplicated archive of all of our topic data in S3. It actually has two inputs. Uh, the latest input file from the last time we ran, so the raw records that are coming in from Copycat from Kafka, and then the existing entire set of data. And the neat trick here is that you take the first, the new set of records that are coming in, sort them using the sort key you know about, so usually a time field, and then identify the prefixes of the time that we found new records for in this incoming batch, reload all of the existing records from the archive for that, and then merge everything together, and then deduplicate, and then write out all the changed and only the changed fields. So we're not touching all of history every time, just the pieces that are changing because we've seen new records, and write that back out to the S3 in the archive. And since uh, S3 doesn't have an atomic move operation, we actually write out new version file names and maintain a single metadata file at the end that points to the current version for each chunk. This lets other tasks, uh, other Spark jobs, see a consistent view of the data and only pick up new records once they're finally done. So this is our true data archive. Every record produced to a topic on Kafka is in this S3 bucket exactly once in the latest state that we've seen for it and sorted according to the ordering for the data set. And the pivotal element of both these things to kind of come back to how much time we are spending on new integrations coming into the data platform is that they're 100% configuration driven. All we need to turn this on is everything that lives in that schema API. So we just push a new job that says, go find this topic and uh, set everything up. And we can provision new tasks with an API call instead of writing code. 
and we just push new configuration to the task scheduler and off we go. So as I was saying earlier, uh, this archive is now immediately usable for three things. So we can put it in data warehouses for interactive querying. We use Amazon Redshift for this. Uh, Redshift is Amazon's managed columnar database. Uh, it speaks Postgres, so our, our BI analysts love it, and you can just put Looker in front of it and have da visual dashboards because it speaks SQL, and it's optimized for doing bulk loads from S3. Uh, we built a lot of custom tooling around it, around the Redshift management APIs that let us provision multiple Redshift clusters to basically slice up different pieces of that data warehouse, or sorry, of the data lake into individual data marts and generate schedules based on our metadata to reload data from S3 into one or more places. And this lets us keep the clusters small and performing optimally and keep the sensitive financial information away from people who don't need to see it by having separate warehouses and only handing out keys to the appropriate ones. We can also use these primary archives to drive batch processing for derived data and ad hoc analysis. So this is just Spark again. Spark has a very well supported S3 driver and we've expanded it to support the organizational and schema metadata that's involved in Twilio FS. Uh, other engineering teams that need to do derived data analysis uh, just write dedicated Spark jobs and use our infrastructure to schedule them. So if we have something raw coming in, some raw set of events, um, and we want to produce a new drive set, you just write a Spark job, pick them up, and then run it over all the input continuously and just spit it back out. We also use Spark for ad hoc processing, so stuff that's not in the warehouse, but every once in a while somebody wants to go and query a whole huge amount of data, like three years worth of API logs, and it's expensive and slow to load that into a Redshift cluster just to run a few queries, so we use Jupyter Notebook in front of Spark to just do this on an ad hoc basis. This tends up to come up a lot during outage response or if you're prototyping new scheduled batch jobs, right? Just type it out as a SQL query, see what happens, and then port it to a full-on Spark job. And uh, I'm gonna sound like a broken record, but we also use Spark in streaming mode to do stream processing. And this is what it looks like. You just connect a Spark job in stream mode to the Kafka topic, process data in real time, and then emit results back into a different Kafka topic to, to do whatever you want with. And finally, uh, we can consume directly from Kafka topics and write the data to online storage systems. And this is pretty simple. Uh, you just run Kafka Connect or something else that takes records from Kafka and puts them into a database, and then you can just query it. So we have data in our pipeline. We've consumed it and put it in a bunch of places to store it and do compute over it. How do we know that we have all the data in the right places that it needs to be and that it's correct everywhere, as I was saying earlier? So first, Kafka's consumer offset tracking uh, assures that we only acknowledge records as delivered to a system once we've actually stored or processed it. So those offsets are available in Kafka themselves as streams, so you can track and monitor consumer progress over time. So if we see that a particular system gets stuck or slows down, you can set off an alert because it's not going to be committing new offsets and not making forward progress. And make sure that you set off an alert and you go fix it. For data correctness, uh, we reuse our topic metadata to do lightweight SMO testing. And it's pretty much like I was hinting at earlier, you just say, oh, well, we know what a key is for this data, and just run a job that connects to each data store, and then says count unique, and then says, cool, everything lines up, or maybe this is wrong, uh, we should go look at this. So to recap, what we have is we went through an event-oriented data pipeline architecture, and used Kafka as a reliable and high-performance data bus. Uh, it gives us a strong foundation for reasoning about and planning data flows between systems, systems that produce data, the systems that process and consume that data, and the systems that store it. I spent a lot of time talking about why strongly typed data with a single source of truth for schemas is important, and why you'll benefit from doing this in your data processing systems. And I touched briefly on the properties of these systems, uh, how the properties of this doing this guarantees that data is delivered everywhere it needs to be, and how we can build monitoring systems to verify that this is the case and talk through all the systems we have to actually do useful things with the data once we have it in our event pipeline at Twilio. So to revisit our motivating story from earlier, instead of this n squared size web of connections between sources and sinks made directly, we have a single path. Data flows as a single source of events through the Kafka bus, and any system that needs that particular type of data can just connect and listen to it. Uh, if we come along and change the schema, right, um, the systems that are connected either seamlessly convert data to the version they expect, thanks to Avro, or they gracefully process to the end of the topic with the old version, and then we just update them to roll onto the new one. The end of the year comes around, and the PM just requests a temporary Redshift cluster with the historical data to build numbers for the slide deck. We try out new data stores all the time. Uh, we find out that they totally suit their needs, or they don't, and we just drop them in as new flavors of Kafka consumers. We run spam detection code or fraud detection code that runs nightly Spark jobs over all of history, 
updates the new models, and then reloads those models with the new parameters into streaming jobs to watch for spam in real time. We hook up Elasticsearch or whatever new uh, online store we want, and the new full text search feature works flawlessly, and so on. So yeah, that's all about all I have. Uh, thank you for listening. I hope what I've shared today can help you with your own data challenges. Thank you, Sam. Um, on behalf of the organization, here's your mug. And for everyone, now it's lunchtime, so please go out and enjoy lunch.